Welcome to Aveiro Tech Week, an event that combines technology, art and culture. Today's session, curated by Art Tech Aveiro 2021, is dedicated to art, technology and the digital world. Please welcome on stage our moderator, Paulo Bernardino Bastos from the University of Aveiro, Victoria Vesna from the University of California, and Miriam Tavares from the University of Algarve. Okay, is it uh, ready? Can I start? Great. Bom, antes de mais, uh, queria agradecer, obviamente, a uh, esta organização desta Aveiro Tech Week por nos integrar também nestas sessões Tech Days. Nós uh, organizamos este ano o evento uh, Artec, this year a tech, uh, an Artec que é um event de, de uma associação internacional that is from an que faz international uma association that promotes a series of events uh, in media in which these Artec events are included. And it's a great pleasure to bring to you these sessions to Aveiro and to create a protocol with the director, Mr. Fernando Marques, that is sitting here with us, that has accompanied us in the Congress Center, where we have been promoting the conferences and exhibitions 
Lopes, que também With the help um of Professor Maria Manuela Lopes, that is also organizing with me this uh, event, and of course to thank all the municipalities team that has supported us with this organization, and also the university, the research center that covers the scientific part of this group. Que também Praxis Praesi, which e, portanto, I uh, coordinate. And so what we are trying to do here today is, today is to open a debate around the theme. I, I don't know, I, I think that uh, two speakers are still missing. Uh, Lucia Santayana, that is going to be participating on streaming, and Gerald Estadia, which, uh, who will also be here online. Uh, you can see them now in ours in your in this screen. I don't know if Lucia is seeing me. I'm I'm seeing you, Lucia. Can you wave? Lucia, are you? Lucia, can you see me? Ah, she's seeing me. Lucia, muito bom ter você. Okay, Gerald, I hope that you can see us too from Macau. Bom. Este é o nosso painel. Tenho aqui so, this is our panel on uh, my right. Tavares, we have Professor Miriam Tavares from the University of Algarve. And the Professor and on Victoria Vesna. E depois tem aí nos vossos ecrãs. And then you have o, o in your screens Gerald Estadia and Lucia Santaella, my great e friend é from São Paulo. Nós and this vamos, is our panel. We are going, eu vou, eu vou and, and, and um before everything else, I'm going to be switching no, from English. Portuguese and English. Uh, uh, we have a simultaneous uh, interpretation for those who need Victoria translation. Please collect your devices on the front desk. E vamos ter também apresentações uh, we will also have some presentations in Portuguese by Professor Lúcia Santella and okay. Professor Miriam Tavares. Then I would like to thank you, of course, the uh, municipality, because this 10th edition of the International Conference in Digital Arts and Interactive Arts took place here in Aveiro Tech Week under the name of Hybrid Praxis, Art, Sustainability and Technology art, technology in digital world. Future creativity is now, is the theme for us to discuss somehow. We uh, will see uh, some artistic creations supported by technology and computing. And the aim will be present new opportunities and aesthetic concepts motivated by technology through the presentation and, of, uh, and some testimonials and portfolios of some work that we will see here, especially Victoria Vesna. Victoria Vesna, she will bring uh, a topic under this name, the art and science of deep listening. Uh, Victoria Vesna, I, I, I think I can call a, fr can call a friend, and uh, she's an artist and prof professor at the Euclid Department uh, of Design, Media Arts and Director, and also she is director of the Art Science Center at School of the Arts and California Nanosystem Institute. With her installations, she investigates all communication technologies after collective behavior and the perception of identity shift in relation to scientific innovation. You will see that, I'm just reading to be more clear, but we will see that through uh, Vesna presentation and her work actually involves long-term collaborative collaboration with computers, nanoscientists, neuroscientists, evolutionary biologists, and uh, she brings the experience to her students because she is an artist and she's a professor too, and she involves these both sides of the academic world and the, the artistic world. And uh, of course, Victoria has been exhibiting all over the world she will show some uh, to us, and then we will see it. Lucia, Lucia Santella, uma, uma grande amiga também do Brasil. Is a great friend from Brazil. Brazil. 
that uh, I had great pleasure of meeting for long years de, in many, de, de in many places in all over Brazil. Brazil. She's a, a, wo a woman that spreads throughout the whole Brazil. She's very well known. Lucia will talk to us about uh, uh, artificial intelligence in art. And I have a question for you. Very, Lucia is very provocative. You will like to hear her talking about her work. She is a professor. I would say that in English for you to is a professor in the graduate uh, program in communication and semiotics and coordinator of the graduate program in technologies of intelligence and digital design. Uh, she has done postdoctoral internships abroad and was a, a guest pro and was a guest professor and a researcher at several European and Latin American universities. Uh, she has been published more than 50 books and organized more than 20. Uh, uh, she, she, if she put it all together, she has more than 500 books and uh, things and uh, articles. And she's very well known in our community in art, uh, dealing with these uh, theoretical subjects of um, uh, semiotics and art critics, image, and all that. And I had the pleasure to be with her in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, in the uh, PUC, uh, Pontífice Universidade Católica de São Paulo. She is currently a professor at uh, the Oscar Sala Scher at São Paulo University Institute of Advanced Studies. I said all that in English, but Lucia, claro que você para nós é sempre uma referência. Lucia, of course, you are a reference to all of us. We love your books and you are a part of the Portuguese community. And it's a great pleasure for being here with you today. Miriam is also a, a, a very well-known person to us for several years. She's a friend. She's going to talk to us about recovering senses and the aesthetic um, part uh, on the digital world. Miriam Tavares. Tem esses nomes, por bem. mas é uma professora associada da Universidade de Algarve. Tem formação académica nas ciências da comunicação, na semiótica e nos estudos culturais. Tem desenvolvido o seu trabalho de investigação também e da produção nas técnicas. And production, and production theoric and 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 she is also a coordinator, and I'm, I'm taking off my mask. I forgot to take it off. So she's a coordinator in the Research Center of Arts and Communication. She's a friend that has participated in several activities, conferences that we have organized, doctorships, juries, and so she's a, a person that is very well integrated in our organization. Gerald Estadio, can you, how are you listening to me? Gerald, he will talk from arts to tangible experiences. That is the main uh, title for this presentation. And actually, he's a professor of Faculty of Arts and Humanities, Department of Creative Industry at the University of St. Joseph in Macau, where I believe he is now at this moment. Uh, his research uh, and uh, artistic activity are now folks on areas of interactivity, hacking, and digital fabrication. You will see, you will explain us what that means. And he is also a member of several international col collaborative uh, uh, experimentations, such as Museum Mix and Hack My Search, and developed artistic projects in local international museums, integrating interactive technology and digital fabrication. All these presentations that I did, better than all that we can take from these words, is to see what they have to present us. And uh, in that uh, order, uh, we will start with Victoria Vesner. And welcome to coming. And uh, it's your time. So <laughs> here we go. There's my voice. Uh, I want to thank Paula. Thank you very much for this beautiful introduction and the honor to be here. 
in person, in person. It's so beautiful, thank you. And I have the weather that's gorgeous. I also want to thank uh, Manuela Maria Lopez, who worked so hard to get me here, and here I am. Uh, and it's also such a pleasure to welcome all of you in the room with masks and all. Um, we're planetary citizens, and one of the silver lining of this pandemic is that you're here, I'm here, there, over there in Sao Paulo, in Macau. So right at this moment, we're in four different continents. It's quite beautiful. Um, and for this session, I wanted to talk about listening and sound. And so we will be listening a lot together uh, in relation to the topic of our tech and sustainability. I know that all of you are familiar with STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. Now we plunked inside arts and STEAM. Uh, we have actually reframed, thank you, the idea of STEAM to be science, technology, instead of engineering ecology, because engineering is part of technology, then we have arts, we keep arts. And instead of math, that's both in science and technology and engineering, we have mindfulness. I think that's actually the key, and it's really the key of what I want to present today. So what I would like to start with is for uh, the presenters across the globe, whoever's logged on, both now and in the future in the recording, to start with a breath. And if I could have the lights off, we're going to listen to our breath. So lights off, off me too. So if you could just close your eyes for a minute if you feel comfortable to do so. If not, it's gonna be dark enough. And take a first breath to connect to the people here who are from here and maybe other places too. And we're all breathing this air. Now connect to your eyes in this visual culture that we live in if your eyes are closed or not, just remember that there are two spheres connected to your brain that's connected to other people's spheres and brains. And take one breath. Now, using the technique of Google visualization, take a breath and move from this auditorium outside of the ceramic building, look down and start zooming out, zooming out, zooming out, and realize how much of what stresses us daily is not important. Let's take a breath. Thank you. Thank you for breathing with me. And I start with um, this quote from Bernie Krauss, who's a soundscape ecologist. In 1968, he founded the Wild Sanctuary, dedicating to archiving and recording natural soundscapes. He co coined the terms geophony and anthropony. He's also the very first musician who used the Moog synthesizer, some of you may be familiar with, and actually introduced electronics into music. So he actually helped scientists and engineers with his life work of using sound and ecoacoustics to survey the impacts of change and biodiversity. Now, 
we, have, we just breathe together. So think about how much we breathe daily. When we're at a rest, it takes about 16 breaths per minute. This means 960 breaths in an hour, 23,000 plus breaths a day, and so on and so on. So I may be breathing a little faster now because I'm excited I'm standing and talking here. But the breathing is really what keeps us all alive. And the air we breathe is full of particles that we're not sure what they are. So as we breathe, we live. And we hear our breath occasionally, a lot of times not. And then we have our heart, which beats 100 times a second in one day, a t uh, times a day, I'm sorry. And 35 million times a year, you can be brain dead and survive. You cannot be heart dead. So a lot of what I base my talk on also is about the mind-heart connection that Buddhists talk about. I'm not sure where I'm pointing to when I do this. There we go. And uh, now I'm going to quote my favorite person. Okay, I got it. I was. Do you hear my clicker back there in the sound room? It's somehow not advancing. There's the heart. Okay. Now, who's advancing, me or you? <laughs> All right, we can imagine this room having this going on. So we don't hear this. Our hearing is actually very, very narrow. And that's part of the humanity's problem, in my opinion. So if we listen a little more, or if we become aware of what we can't hear, we actually have an opportunity to make a difference. Here's how, our, how narrow our signs are. You probably remember this from your classes in chemistry or biology. But this is really important to constantly remind ourselves about, especially when we have so much going on with our uh, microwaves and infrareds and radio waves and cell systems and all of this interrelating with our own cell structures. So let's start with going under the ocean where we will hear some of the sounds. Hopefully this plays. These are planktons. Planktons produce 80% of the oxygen we breathe. Eighty percent of the oxygen we breathe is produced by planktons that are currently threatened by the noise, the pollution. We will dive in a little bit later. Uh, now we're going to go to the cosmos. If you could have the sound a little louder. Yesterday was the opening of this conference. Yesterday, William Shatner from Star Trek went up into the rocket 
with Bezos' sponsorship. We can talk about that all day, but we won't. We will come back to that. We will also talk about interstellar space and what Nikola Tesla said that really made it so controversial that he was receiving his ideas about wireless technology from outer space. And of course, we're going to pay attention to some of the wonderful people who have made kind of moved into this idea of creating um, sound out of nothing. So about a hundred years ago, a little more now, this Russian physicist Lev Sergeyanovich, um, and on the right is Clara Rockmore, who was one of the famous people working with the theremin. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that this was actually used by Beach Boys for good vibrations, the sound of the theremin. And the, it actually was um, developed for an engineering purpose. So he was trying to invent a device that would measure the density of various gases. And because he was looking for the gases, he started realizing that it was making sound as the gases were changing. Another thing that I find absolutely fascinating, I'll just drop a seed here and not talk about it, is the idea of these acoustic levitation cha chambers that are being worked on, where you can actually start thinking about moving objects with sound. Uh, and this is something that NASA is working on, of course, as you can imagine. Uh, a lot of the idea of deep listening and um, just the sense of vibration and sound comes from um, science, but also the, this is a picture of the uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks who claim that through their sounds and trumpets they can also lift objects. So a lot of what I was inspired by with my work <laughs> actually has predecessors of anybody who hears deep listening will hear of um, beautiful Paulina Oliveras, of course, John Cage, Bill Fontana recently, I've been working with some on resonance and bells. Um, but all of these artists, actually, if you dig in a little bit deeper, are either practicing or uh, learning about Buddhism. And so the connection of sound and light is actually really important to me. And I think to all of us should be more and more because we're just so oriented to visuals and seeing is believing has become kind of a way to talk about situations. So if you think about sonoluminescence, um, there's actually research about that too. Um, Dr. Seth Vatterman, who is at UCLA and also has the anechoic chamber that would be another whole lecture, <laughs> um, developed this idea of star in a bottle. So he, through vibrations and sound, he managed to get a particle moving in a bottle. Again, not enough time to talk about it, but just a little seed of thought. So to, to talk about the science behind vibrations, we start thinking about patterns in nature and structures in nature. And if you think of a beehive and the hexagonal structures, you cannot separate that from the social structures of the bees and the sound and the honey that's produced. All of this is an incredibly complex system that's endangered right now 
So we have to also pay attention to that. Um, my, own, my own entrance into this world is through nanotech. So this is uh, Dr. Jim Jelski, my partner, who I've collaborated with quite a bit, explaining how the scanning tunneling microscope works. And I'll just briefly touch on that too, so you get a sense of why vibrations are important. So if you imagine this finger to be an Eiffel Tower and the atom to be like a golf ball, you're actually going through the surface of, of the structure and that finger would be a fine needle that's terminated by a single atom. Now, how can we even imagine this? We can't. So what we're doing is we're feeling, we're feeling the, the, the structure and the texture of the atomic level and basically looking at probabilities, electron probabilities and waves and it's empty space. So at the bottom of it all, there's what we think of nothing there, but it's all waves. And this is a good way to describe it as at the very beginning of the century, we have the phonograph. That's exactly the basis of the scanning tunneling microscope. If you try to imagine that the needle goes against the groove and creates these sounds. So everything is waves. If you look at different waves here, the um, atoms, electrons, gold atoms, and then a fantastic uh, a thing here that happened, but I would say 10, 15 years ago, is when Jim Jowski and his group actually looked at yeast and fibroblast cells, and they used the instruments to go on the uh, surface of yeast cells, which actually are way too big for scanning to electron microscopy. Um, but again, it produced sound. And so here, I hope I can um, play you this sound. There. So this is the sound of the yeast cell that's vibrating. And it's at one level. The next one, this one, the yeast cell that is stressed. So it's under stress, meaning a, a little bit of whiskey was thrown into the yeast cell. It's because Junjevsky is Scottish. And then the last one, which we'll play next, is probably the most fascinating one because it's a dead cell. So even the cell that's completely dead was emitting sound, and not necessarily white sound. Nobody quite knows. So what we're talking about is waves and connections. And the, the idea of these waves that are actually what manifests, and the idea of uh, nanometer scale vibrations that happen on a cellular level, and how does this influence our own cells and our own systems is really what's important. So the difference between waves and matter is that waves connect to each other. They're the result of energy and connection. So it's all about the energetic exchange. Here's a slide from Jim Jewski. He gave me this to show um, that they're actually looking at nanomechanical patterns of cells to detect cancer. Uh, so this would be non-invasive way of detecting cancers on a cellular level. This is Carlo Ventura, who does amazing work with um, uh, heart cells. Uh, and he, he and Jim Jewski actually share an interest in looking at the vibrations on this level and how you can analyze this. And so, if we can go to the next slide. Here we go. This is, a, uh, these are cells from the heart. And what's absolutely amazing about this is that each cell actually vibrates. It, it, it's like a heartbeat. Um, and this was very much an inspiration 
to the late Milford Graves, who collaborated with Carlo Ventura for a long time, using heartbeat as the basis of his jazz, and actually really uh, uh, projecting the possibility of healing using sound and using his music, and, and really analyzing why do people feel so much better after a certain concert. Um, their collaboration resulted in a lot of work. And then very briefly, um, to mention different layers of exploration of uh, sounds that are not something that we hear, but that surround us, is this blue morpho butterfly. Um, the blue morpho butterfly is also endangered. And what Jim Jewski's lab did is trying to figure out how metamorphosis happens, but also measuring this in relation to sound. And so we looked at MRI scans, and we discovered that there's eight pumps inside the chrysalis that beat like a heart. So there's like a constant beat going on. And while that constant beat is going on, something else is also happening. For those of you who are tech buffs, the way that was done, it was impossible to do with scanning electron microscopy, but they developed this very cool system where they had an optical beam that was shot on a kind of a micro mirror on top of the chrysalis, and as the chrysalis would move, it would actually be registered. And what we saw was this, which actually was phenomenal, and that would be that metamorphosis does not happen gradually, it happens in bursts. So what you have is this constant heartbeat, and then you have these bursts of change. And I started thinking how it related, this is 2008, when we were in a financial crisis, which we're entering into again. So it was the metamorphosis of the social level, because when you look at the financial graphs, they look identical, like up and then down and up and down. Um, we looked also at the structure of the wing, and just for the painters in the room, that blue color has no pigment. It is purely the nano optics in our eyes that are translating the structures into the iridescent blue. And so how, did, how was this experienced? Uh, let me first play you the sound. This is the sound of a chrysalis being um, transformed over a period of two weeks into a butterfly. So this is how the installation ended up being. And I have students asking, wait, how did you get from those graphs to this? <laughs> so it's a longer story, but I'm showing you the two probably most magnificent examples I was offered an opportunity to do. Uh, one is on, uh, on the left, is uh, at the St. John the Divine Cathedral in Gdansk in Poland. Um, and the other one is in, um, I believe that was in Dublin. Yes, that was in Dublin. Um, so what you're doing is you're sitting, and when you sit down or stand, some people stand on the pedestal, you have to center yourself and be quiet to get the most effects. So it's actually the opposite interactivity in the sense that you get the most results if you're centered. I'm very interested in this work and continue to be. Um, 
And then to talk a little bit about brain waves, because we're all in this room sharing brain waves and sound waves, and you're listening to me and processing, and maybe thinking of other things too. Um, I had the kind of the honor, pleasure to be invited to do a CD-ROM, this is 1998, with uh, Stephen Hawking. And my first meeting with him uh, totally shifted my whole idea about, first of all, technology in relation to brain, in relation to the idea of cyborgs, but also the fact that he was not able to communicate at all maybe 10, 20 years before the technology got to the point where somebody who can only move their pinky was actually communicating. But what also made me in awe of how much we take for granted with our brains is when I said hello to him. So you are now Stephen Hawking, and I will say hello to you, and I will respond for you. Hello. Hello. That few seconds felt like an eternity. And I suddenly realized that everything I would say would take that span of time. And how much I took for granted that what I say goes into your brain, gets processed, thought about you, even think about other things. And it's just normal. It's amazing. So if we talk about brain waves, you have all these different waves that a lot of you are, of course, familiar with, and a lot of artists are actually very much uh, experimenting with. Uh, and this is also something that's, uh, I think, critical in artwork making. Where do you bring people's brains to a different place where they can remove themselves from the stressful vibes of every day? So with that, I, I was in a, um, research residence in Imra in Marseille. And this is Dr. Constance Hammond explaining to us how the brain works. Of course, we have glasses of wine there because we're in France. Um, and these, this is a group of sociologists, scientists, artists discussing the brain. I thought it was all very kind of funny. We were wearing um, uh, tinfoil hats, which is also what's experimented with. And I, until I started really understanding a little more and I started collaborating with Dr. Mark Cohen, who's there with a the beautiful tin foil hat, but who actually said, you know what, I'm actually very interested in doing this. And I told him, okay, well, let's talk about the octopus. And he was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm actually fascinated with how the octopus is, the entire body is the brain. And then the, each of the tentacles are separate. Uh, and it's my idea of embodied intelligence. He kind of was not so happy about the idea of embodied intelligence because it's not proven, uh, but I kept going at it. And this was uh, a year, after a year of work, I did something on a Ferris wheel in Santa Monica Pier where people would wear these octopus crowns and kind of occupy the industrial wheel with the biological, so it was a whole thing. But the end result was that after a year of research and work and development, I ended up with all these octopus crowns. And I didn't know what to do with them, so I came up with this other idea um, to have two people sitting together with, different, uh, with eight different sounds and eight different colors. And when they would connect with the, no words, just through their brain waves, the colors would be the same. If, if they're disconnected, they're actually creating jazz. Um, I, you can look at this online. I, I, I don't have enough time to show it, but I wanted to point it out. So to delve back into noise pollution underwater, uh, all of this is going on, and we don't see it, we don't hear it, but it affects us deeply. Think about what's going on right now. I, you may have seen it on the news, but all the ships are now just stuck because of the different situations with post-pandemic, et cetera. And we're really in a crisis about consumerism. This is really what's happening. So with the noise pollution, with all these different things going on where we don't see, we're actually creating big problems. And to raise awareness about this, 
I worked with uh, Dr. Alfred Wendel at the University Angewandte in Vienna, who uh, actually worked with biologists to um, scan, 3D scan planktons, these micro creatures. And then Martina Froschel, who's an animator working in his lab, animated them. They invited me to do something with it. I was like, what do I do with this? I decided to make them as important as whales. And to have people, if you remember the blue morph was all about centering, here again, if you're centered, you get to see these gorgeous creatures. If you're off-center, which most of us are, you're creating a lot, a lot of noise. And honestly, I could not keep the noise going for more than 30 seconds because everybody left the room. But I made a point of saying this is 24-7 going on underwater. That's the majority of our planet. So. This is pretty much the way the audience was experiencing it most of the time. And I'll play just a tiny section of it to give you an idea. So the sound a little bit up, please. this endless circle of going for fossil fuels, bringing them up, creating pro objects, transporting them, throwing them into the trash, and then it, they break down into the plastic, breaks down into micro and nanoplastic, that then even planktons are eating nano and microplastics. It's a disaster. I want to remind you when we were breathing, 80% of the air we're breathing in this room outside is produced by planktons. I totally feel urgent about this message. And back to space and then I will end. So I, we go down to underwater and then out into space. And again, I want to mention that the concert, conference was open during this moment. I think it's an important moment because it shows the influence of culture and the influence of what science fiction does. I visited um, with a lot of different NASA, SpaceX, et cetera, and I'm always amazed at how much they have from Star Trek and sci-fi and Arthur C. Clarke. And here we are, the big thing of Bezos, who actually is contributing to the whole problem, is to take Shatner up into space. It's, it's worthy of discussion. So. It's also, it also should be mentioned that we are planetary citizens and it is important to think of ourselves that way. This is a moment that's uh, at the January 2020, very beginning of the new year, uh, just when the pandemic was starting, in the year of the rat, China actually landed uh, their um, probe into the other side of the moon. This is very significant. It's, it's, something that was kind of ignored, but it's actually huge. Um, and then we had Japan that lands a capsule on an asteroid. Crazy, if you think about what would be involved to do that. Um, and then recently, we had a micro dust particle micrometeorite that's billions of years old found on Earth. Um, I will skip through this, but just mention that this project that I will show now was actually shown at Joshua Tree. We'll end with that. Um, and Joshua Tree is in the Mojave Desert in California, where the aliens told this man, Kritzer, how to build this structure. And it was the place where, in the 60s, the biggest uh, alien uh, kind of collection of people, uh, people worshiping the aliens would come, space convention. Uh, this is the structure. That's where we actually did the blue morph for the first time. And now we did uh, something at the Integratron. That was on the, in the pandemic. So what you're seeing here, who you're seeing here is 
Paul Geluso, who was working in New York on the sound, binaural sound, so you had to have earphones. On the right was Nancy Carl and the Integraton playing uh, crystal bowls. And then what we had is connecting, I need the sound here, connecting to the COVID data. <laughs> And we had a drone sound that was the constant sound to relax you from the stress of the COVID data. <laughs> and then we had data from NASA and the observatories. And this is us. So just like we have people participating from Brazil and Macau and other places. We were actually creating this music, sound, meditation together. And also connecting to the idea that the Earth's magnetic field vibrates like a drum, that we have an opportunity to listen to the Mars rover, which online you can do, but I'll play it for you just for a second. So this is the rover moving through Mars, the sound of it. And I'll end with a very short three minute meditation that's actually in uh, Portuguese and Spanish that was requested by uh, my collaborator, uh, Clarissa Ribeiro, who's in Fortaleza in Brazil, and she asked if we could do collective meditation to aid with our minds the indigenous people of Brazil, which a lot of people don't know is that about 5,000 women from different tribes came to Brazil to demonstrate. So this actually is in Portuguese, and I'll, and I'll end with this. Should be playing.
Okay, thank you. By the way, that meteorite was Campo de Cielo that fell in Argentina 4,000 years ago and was first discovered by the indigenous people. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, vamos, nós, uh, I think it's better to see all the other presentations. And at the end, we have uh, uh, 10 minutes for asking questions if you would like to ask something to the presenters, okay? Uh, agora, nós íamos para a Lúcia Now Santaella. Now, we would uh, Lúcia. hear Lúcia Santaella. Está me ouvindo? Lúcia, can you hear me? Ok, estou te ouvindo. I'm hearing tá, you. Ah, muito bem. Ok. É bom ouvir você. It's Ainda nice aqui. hearing you. Estamos ouvindo bem. Can you bem. hear me right? Sim, We are. está tudo bem. Yes, everything ok. Olha, Lúcia, Lúcia muito bom ter você aqui. Pena com essa pandemia. Não podermos estar juntos. It's a um, shame a plateia está that due to the pandemic we cannot be together in the Metade same space. Está online, We have não lots estar aqui. of people here in Porém, the auditorium, but also é online. Momento. Para Now falar it's your e provocar to as massas to talk com a sua inteligência artificial na arte. Artificial intelligence in art. Why? É o seu momento para This falar is your moment. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much. Uh, Paulo, é um enorme Paulo, prazer. It's a great estar pleasure to be here Agradeço with you today. Thank you so very much for inviting me here to participate and to give me the opportunity to see this amazing presentation by Victoria Vesta. Thank you so very much. I will stay to hear all the other prese presenters. I will be talking about art and artificial intelligence. Why? After this amazing presentation, I must tell you, I'm not going to make a, a slide presentation because The theme that I'm going to talk about is very, very recent and is still awakening from several, coming from several interrogations. And so, before this, I decided to make a presentation through a preliminary debate uh, without any certainties, uh, a way to make us think about this subject. Researchers that work in the biggest research centers uh, in developing AI are unanimous in assuring that we are still in the dawn of the AI. Called weak AI. This already works as an indicator that the AI is still beginning, is still in the beginning of its development. Nonetheless, AI is already acting almost always in an invisible way in all the fields of human activities. Sem dúvida. Undoubtedly, the researches of AI spread today throughout a diversity of activities. Personal assistants, intelligent, organize our agendas. The document automators help us in several tasks. Softwares analyze behaviors 
online. Algorithms are able to predict the success of audiovisual narratives. Advanced softwares are, are used to the perceptive recognition of speech and also our faces. Deep learning is used to for medical diagnosis and for health treatments. Softwares for autonomous uh, air systems, robot cars. With uh, we have robots that look like human beings that talk with us uh, in a very nice way, and the advances just keep s surging. Many have witnessed the birth of AI researches in the 1950s. But it was the convergence of several factors that led us to its recent explosion. Examples, the exponential rising of the processing capacities of computers, the, the amount of data that we, that we produce today and that are sown and obtained in the Internet and the, power, the connection power in several levels of the neural networks in an artificial way. But it's not this story that interests us, uh, us today. And to this presentation that I'm bringing to you today, what interests us is to point out that in art field, we now have a surge of a new way of creative production and art production that has been incorporated by artists and concerted in the interest of theoreticals and critics of culture and arts. Of course, art would not be outside this set. Far from being a strange phenomena, it is a way of creation based in the secular story of arts in technological, technologically inseminated that accentuated in a progressive way from the digital revolution in a in multiple in multiple ways that created net art, web art, digital art, computer art, algorithm art, interactive art, robotic art, and so on and so on. The art that is produced today by sharing, by creative sharing from an artist that resources to AI technology, which is called the machine learning in, and deep learning is not an isolated phenomenon. Since 1968, when we had the first art exhibitions based in technology in our gallery wise in New York, and in the exhibition in a large scale of cybernetic serendipity in London, over 50 years ago, led us to a development of computer art. Coincidentally, in 
in the middle of the 50s of last century, cognitive sciences started to rise, having uh, as one of its scopes the development of AI. Such development never stopped attracting the attention of artists that worked in partnership with computer algorithms. And this is uh, so true that when AI researches were still starting, artists were in the front, in the front uh, page and, try, and tried to work with genetic algorithms, giving examples throughout, through their works during the 90s. So since then, artistic works incorporated AI resources and accompanied step by step the development of this technological field. Ten years ago, researches in AI exploded. Together with, as obvious, artistic works that started to project more and more in this field. I don't have here the intention of explaining technical questions of art, nor do I have the intention of making a presentations of works and artists that are producing works using AI algorithms. What I intend to debate here are the aesthetic interrogations that this kind of work and art is rising. The AI methods open new possibilities in the art as in creative economics, even in entertaining giving us rich experiences and profoundly interactive. At the same time that AI is opening new ex artistic expression fields, art itself, based in AI, is becoming an agenda of research and uh, fundamental crea creation responding to cr uh, aesthetic worries and would not have arisen without the AI event. In this context, the question that I would like to put here is, firstly, new interrogations about the partnership of the artist and AI resources for our traditional conceptions about aesthetic creation. Another question, what is the role of the artist? If a machine can produce visual art, edit a movie, write a screen, a play screen, or compose a music, what is the value of the artist? Where, where does it stand, the creative, the creative possibility of the artist? Is creativity nothing more than the the, than a, a, a specific characteristic of a, the human being, we don't have to go back to ancient debates about what is art and what, what it's not art. If we take as a reference the pluralism that is rising 
throughout the 20th century, these debates become boring. Before this, the argument that I rise is that the development of the technological arts in history suggests that this is a good way for us to understand the aesthetic phenomenon currently in the creativity through AI. The question of creativity in connection with the computers some decades ago uh, has been changing the traditional conceptions of aesthetics so that we, we don't have to be scared of the creativity that we encounter today by AI. We don't have space for uh, in art for it to fall into conservatory tendencies that are the result of fear. Art is risk. Territory, unknown territory exploration. Art is adventure through the ways of strangeness to transfiguration of the human sensibility. sensibility. And so AI is putting us now under the reflection challenge of its implications for the reaccommodation of our way of being in this planet. After all, the technological, digital, electronic art has been here for more than a century ago and has changed the traditional conceptions of aesthetics. Although AI in its alliances with the arts may seem dis disruptive, it does in fact give continuity to a tradition of ruptures that arts have always been uh, known for. And throughout this proposition, we find in the social initiative of the International uh, Society for Arts and Technology, Leonardo, that in collaboration with the Open University of Catalonia, dedicated in 2020 in its magazine note to a more than a dozen articles that talked about the AI in the context of culture. For the organizers of this number, we cannot ignore the exponential growth of apps, of machine learning in all the art domains, v visual, sound, performance, per performative, transmediatic, audiovisual. The activities in this field are growing so fast that people cannot keep the same pace. There are also included in the debates about algorithms and control structures in machine intelligence in public arts, the new standardizations of aesthetics, the cultural productions, the socio-technical dimensions, the relations with dance and democratization of creative tools based in MAP. Nonetheless, the questions surge and talk about the proposals that align all these texts in these volumes that can be synthesized in this following term. 
Creativity is a chemistry in arts and design, represents an evolution of the artistic intelligence, or is it just a metamorphosis of the creative art that generates ways and distinct forms of authorship? The complexity of this situation it's not a symptom that the world is changing, but that surely the world has already changed. Facing these undeniable mutations, we propose that in the AI field, art builds places in which we can think and create other realities. Machine learning produces new support to make sense to the world by choosing examples in definitions of mapping that can possibilitate applications to new ways of artistic expressions. In fact, we have been seeing new kinds of artworks, genera generatives that replicate or incorporate existing artworks or can create pr artistic productions are entirely new. By making this, we are introducing other ways of analyzing and experiencing data and facts in culture. Lastly, the machine learning algorithm through its inputs and resulting outputs and the analysis structure of which is, it is part can be thought as a cultural artifact per se giving us new ways of research, not, all, not all only creative, but also critical, and the different aesthetic productions re with resources based in AI are able to propose solutions not yet experimented for interdisciplinary problems because in many times we have works that depend in the collective intelligence with results of collaborative production, not only between human and human, but also human and machine or machine to machine. We have to remember that machines uh, fed by algorithms are intelligent machines a statement that gives us the key to understand that when the art, artist incor incorporates AI in its work, these resources have a partnership uh, support so that they can share the development and the critical thought in a, a renewed way that is one of the demands in the AI event that is bringing for the debate agenda. I started the year of 2021 in the continuity of this pandemic saying to myself, and pronouncing for those who listen to me that our task is to open sheds of light. As in my modest opinion, I thought of months. Many artists are opening horizons multicolored to prove that the creative resistance always brings sheds of lights that are very important and also hope 
able to open escape points in the shadows of the oppression of the contemporary times. I, didn't, I did not suppose that we would have the opportunity to see this wonderful open lights of Victoria Vest bringing us these lights that are so potent in hope. So welcome all the artists. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Lúcia, pelas suas palavras tão provocadoras. Thank you, Lúcia, for your words, as provocative uh, as inspirational. Now we will hear the other presentations, and I would like you to stay at the end to put any question that you would like to, so that we can have a debate, a, participate, uh, a participative debate. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Agora, gente, vamos passar Now para uma we are going to give the floor de professor to Miriam Professor Miriam Tavares, and Professor Miriam Tavares, professor Miriam Tavares título, will bring us a debate about recovering senses, the, palavra, agora, the role of aesthetics in the digital world. Good afternoon. To you all, I don't know if you can hear me right. This is a very complex task to talk about, to talk after these two wonderful women. Of a very dimensional point of view and a very reflective way of thinking about art and the role that art has in our lives. And almost this obligation that we have as thinkers and artists to somehow... I'm... And on the other hand, to talk a bit about Lucia Santayel, that was my, my teacher when I chose this research career many years ago in Brazil, more than 20 years ago. And as Paulo says, I have been incorporated and I am this hybrid thing between Portugal and Brazil, because I'm here for lots of years now. Well, it was very nice to, to be invited to be here today. I would like to thank the Aveiro Municipality by not only, only support, uh, support us uh, financially, but also putting up with us. Um, but giving us the opportunity to be here today and to giving us all the support to Art Tech here in Aveiro, which is very important to us. And I'd like to thank Paulo and Maria Manuel that have been an ex that have been working so hard for this to happen. What I'm going to bring you today is a kind of not exactly a fusion between these two fabulous presentations that we heard before, but in a certain sense, something that goes against these concerns. So the biggest worry that goes through the work of Victoria is the idea of this of us breathing together and being able to listen to all the things that we cannot hear and making us more aware uh, and stop using as our only sense, the, especially in our relationship with the arts, the visual aspect. And on the other hand, the conference that Lucia 
uh, brought to us is about the role of AI in the creation of arts and the participation of these relationships that you are experiencing. I'm going to talk about its history, but also there is some, a question that we, is rising, that is the idea of senses. We are talking about a new moment. I'm not going to talk about what is art, but uh, an, another moment that demands from us another kind of relationships with this field. And so I'm going to start to read and to make my, my presentation. We are in a digital universe, a world that is crossed by machines that bring us together, but also bring us apart. We are overwhelmed with images that escaped the domain of arts. And today, we have thousands of productions by several digital devices that are uh, spread throughout the social media. The software transformed itself in images. And the question that we have is, how can we deal, after all these years, after all these theories and technological innovations, to images? I brought this photo from Lev Manovich, pretty sexy. He's very, he knows that uh, his image is very important. He takes care of him. And that's, and why do I bring Lev Manovich to, to here? Um, I am a friend of Lev in Facebook. He's a friend to everyone in Facebook, you know. But I had the pleasure of knowing him in a talk that we had to a possible collaboration that didn't go through. And the other day I was going through Facebook preparing this conference and he published in his page, and his page is very interesting because it, it talks about reflections of all he has been doing and producing and thinking about. He's creating thoughts while he writes, and he published in his Facebook page a reflection. He assumed that, although despite all the images, and we are all absorbed by images, he has doubts that we have a full capacity of the impact that they have in us. Philosophy, psychology and semiotic, or other reflections on the art of the production of arts and the studies on its effects, translate in an absolutely un undeniable way the, uh, how we are impacted by image. And this is something that must worry us, or at least makes us, make us think. We should ask ourselves if the future is today, the future built by the vertiginous uh, uh, togetherness of the technologies where we discover the concept of creativity and transform this concept in a kind of magical answer able to solve all the problems that contemporary society imposes. The future is today, or it is not. Because when I talk, the, it turns into present and then past. It is this fixation capacity that becomes so attractive and the belief that we have that the future can be better, that we have time to build it and to transform it. The future is, over all things, an utopia. So, to talk about the future of this creative, artistic, artistic and technological future, I must go back in time and talk about utopia that built it. To recover what was left of this idea of liquid contemporaneity, to talk about art in contemporary world is to talk about its indefinitions and the process of aesthetics of the daily life 
initiated in the 19th century that converted into a rule to creation inside and outside artistic production. The evening show, it's a French philosopher. I like him very much. He talks about the contemporary world. He has a book that is called The Art in the Age of Guys. Guys would be, would be the ethereal, what is not fixated. And he says that art the art volatilizes into an aesthetic ethereal. If we remember that ether was built by philosophers and scientists after Newton as a subtle way that comprises all bodies. So all that is art is converted in aesthetic. If we use aesthetic as a philosophy of the beautiful, all around art becomes beautiful. But art itself tries to escape from this determinism of beautiful, of the beautiful. And he starts this book by saying that a provocative way, in a provocative way that the world is beautiful. Even death is beautiful. People die and get a makeup and go to beautiful coffins. And all our world is impregnated, impregnated by beauty. Art, art, the contemporary art has, volatile. Is, has become volatile. It is replaced by experience of creation or by the sharing of sensations between creator and public. Many times, the public is a, an important part for the art work to exist in a way to be experienced and that only exists in an ephemeral way to evening show. From the 50s, the main question of the modern aesthetic, what is art, in the vanguardist movement has transformed in another question that is more ad adequate for the philosopher. When is it art or how we spectate it? As spectators make art. These questions are more pertinent when we talk about art in the digital and technological universe. To try to answer these questions, I think that it is needed to go back to the, be to the beginning, to go back to the beginning of the thread of history between sciences and history and art. Greeks talked about technical beauty and not what we talk about today that is art. Manuals that we follow until we get to the ars art, to the Romans, which is the Latin word for articulation. We have a very interesting study, a very profound study from a philo philosopher Alfredo Bosi, and he talks uh, about the idea of art, art uh, as something to build, to recognize, and he goes to the initial sense of the, the etymology of the, of the word art, and something that he brings back is that, for example, the word art in German does not come from the same root, not from the Latin word ars, but for, from the word know, to know. And so it, this impacts not only in the, the way that art is produced, but also the sense that we give to art and the, that impacts the way how we uh, produce art in each of the languages. Art was seen as a capacity of articulate ideas and to support materials, but also to how to solve um, the needs uh, from the matter 
It arises from the necessity for artists to find its specificity. In the classical period, art had several rules that artists must follow. Since its birth, the artist was also a creator, not only the artisan, but that that makes a conception of the and the creation of the art and and art is also sustained by science, mathematics, etc. The artist was not only those who who executed, but those who thought about it. At the same time, the modern science gave its first steps and looked at the world around it and realized that to understand it, it needed to organize and uh, bring instruments to it. Galileo and Leibniz, and uh, amongst others, argumented that science should look at uh, things in a real way, to see its mutations, permanence, and textures, and not only theorize about it, and to find immutable truths about the world. We are trying to change culture, focusing in the valuing of citizens. In the 19th century, we had photography and cinema, and also Art Nouveau, based in, an ar in architecture that explores the um, shapes of nature and the objects of the world. The architecture of engineers in the 19th century explored new materials and Bring, brought revolutions to cities. New questions arise that try to find an answers, new answers to a new world. The events and the experiences were trying to question the technological support, the new phys laws of physics, and the new world that was configurating. Several movements arise of va uh, that tried to go against the contemporary or the, the, the aesthetics that were on, in place at that moment. One of the main questions for all of them was what would be the new conceptions of the humanity in history? What would be the f best way to create in a technological way, and what would be the artist's role, which is um, um, a question that Lucia Santanella puts us when we think about the era of art that is crossed by AI. To Nordhauser, the art produced by contemporary artists was ugly. It didn't, um, it didn't fit in the classical art. Aesthetic at that time passed from the philosophy of beautiful to the philosophy of art. And in the 18th century, the art was considered dead. Several thinkers wrote about this disruption. The work of the philosopher talked about the distinction between rational knowledge, clear and precise, and another one, obscure and confused. Both are equivalent, and this may seem something of the past, but we still have the same questions today. Neurosciences try to answer in what way do we think about the feeling and feel rationally? This is something that was not answered until today. Besides recognizing the parity between these two forms of knowledge, Bongard attributes sensibility to sensibility an essential role of the maturing of the human being. This is explored in the field of philosophies, but also the arts. Aesthetics is something sensitive. Inside of this scene explored by Kant, the 
It causes its reflections about art, decreting its death. But the death of this art is not the end of the creation processes. On the contrary, it is the, ma the material production of the artistic expression. In the 20th century, the death of art was also stated by several philosophers. Fruit of a specific context that has profound changes between the, the 19th and the 20th century. And it confounds art with creations of objects, but also the creation of philosophy. The contemporary art is an artistic goal. It's auto-reflexive. We just have to think about the works and the texts of Joseph Kuzun in the creations of Robert Moritz or in the derivations of Andy Warhol. The declarated death of the art and its rebirth as an idea coincides with the advances of the new technologies and the um, approximation of technological fields with pro art productions. The relationship between art and technology has become stronger in the 60s with the help of the ar artist Robert Rauschenberg. This, this artist is fundamental to understand the contemporary art because he, he has gone through all the movements of the 50s and he was one of the first to embrace the cause of technological art. So we don't have an artist that comes from the technological field and becomes an artist, but someone that has experienced all the fields of uh, artistic production but opened its creativity to embrace in a very precocious way, a new field that was opening before him, that was the, the um, computing field. With the help of Bill Clover, they sought the expertise of other scientists to participate in a, in a multidisciplinary uh, field. He experienced in art and technology in an NGO that was created in the 60s to develop the collaboration between artists and engineers. Its function was to promote encounters between people and not create collaboration models. It was to incentivate creativity in its highest point without any restrictions. It comes from the experience realized in uh, October 67, this event that has taken place in the 69 Regiment Armory in New York put together 10 artists that incorporated new technologies. And it was very interesting for us to think that it was in that space, in the armory show of the begin in the beginning of the 20th century, where Deschamps proposed that his famous fountain was uh, presented. They didn't want to uh, reflect on the art. They gave them tools to develop their own projects at the same time where it brought together art and technology from companies that were uh, promoting um, their financial support to allow artistic creations to, um, to arise. For example, the Pepsi Pavilion sponsored several artists in this field. The use of technology by artists were, was also disruptive. The, they were constantly challenged and, over, and overcome. We refer that in, in the West world, the arts were marked by the resurging of humanism and 
e lógica matemática. We try to bring together mathematics and artistic um, production. The futurists were condemned by their modernity, but helped us to understand in a clear, a more clear uh, way the transparency of the production. One of the greatest theoreticals of the futurism was enthusiastic about the aesthetic possibilities of science and believed that the creative, the creative process of a machine was as beautiful as the human production. Gino Severino talked about polyexpressivity of the movies. We can use this term to classify the words, the works produced by technology. We have to recover the sense of aesthetics that convokes our rational and sensitive perception to better experience all others. If Levonovich brought us the concerns about the impacts of images in us, we can at least we can at least understand its dimension or dimensions of the changes suffered in between the, the analogical or digital re uh, register. The fundamental questions today are not about the specificity of the artist, but where in the contemporary world, hyperstatified, we can see art emerge. In, case of, in the case of technological arts that work between design and disruption, we have to recover some senses, the sense of aesthetic even. And we have to continue to provoke several revolutions. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, for all this reflection around the image and the conception of future. I'd like to go to... Hi, are you listening to us? We are yes, not yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's go, Gerard. Gerald uh, will talk yes. uh, about... Uh, I, I'm just you know, refreshing the idea of this... Uh, your title, From Arts to Tangible Experiences. Uh, in fact, I have to ask you to take no more than 20 minutes because we have some other program to go on and uh, we have to go to a laboratory making a test and it's already booked and we have to be there at that time, precisely. Okay? If you don't mind, it's your yeah, time. Sure. Thank you very uh, much, Neron. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to have me for this presentation and for the invitation of uh, Artec to be 21. And um, so my title is From Art to Tangible Experience. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge the three presentation we just had before me and they were really very interesting. And uh, my presentation is going to be much more practical based on a project that we have uh, created uh, at the university in collaboration with a different museum in Macau. Um, so I'll try to keep it as short as possible <clears throat> so I don't put anyone uh, late. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, a quick presentation of myself. So I'm an assistant professor and researcher at the University of uh, St. Joseph in Macau. And I'm part of the Department of Creative Industry. So it includes uh, programs in design, uh, fashion design, uh, communication and media, as well as uh, architecture. And um, one of the key elements of our uh, department uh, is uh, that we have a very practical uh, course and, and then project for students. Um, 
so we have uh, one of the elements that I'm in charge of is the digital fabrication lab. And within this lab, we are trying to uh, provide um, different possibility for students to experiment, not only within the class, but also uh, with project. So next slide, please. So th the context of where we are working is uh, roughly presented here in this slide, where uh, we are in the university paradigm, so in the, the middle of the graph. Uh, so it means that we, are, we have a lot of constraint as professors and with students and, and so on. Uh, but then we try to work with three different uh, topics around uh, the project that I'm going to present to you. The first one is digital fabrication and interactive interface. Uh, so that's uh, related more to the uh, technical side of uh, things. Uh, so it includes computer head manufacturing. So this is where we have, uh, we usually uh, use a lot with our student uh, 3D printers as well as uh, laser cutters. So they are the, the, the bread and butter of our work with our students. Uh, and then this is also where we have a, a creative process that usually we go through a design thinking approach uh, to identify what we, we want to achieve and how we are going to do, to do it. And then we use a lot of uh, software, obviously, where we start on the computer and then it ends up on the machine. But the machine is just responding to what we create on the software. So either by uh, pure human creation or by uh, the pure algorithm, uh, algorithmic, sorry. Uh, so we use some algorithm or, or dedicated mathematics software uh, to generate element of our uh, creation. Uh, on the bottom uh, left, so I put the museum, and this is uh, our playground for those projects. Uh, so we collaborate with two uh, different uh, museums in Macau, and uh, we we like to use uh, to work with museum because it gives us uh, an environment where we can uh, be uh, as much as possible creative and then open to the to the general public, to the city, and to the local community, as well as uh, be able to collaborate with uh, artists, uh, whether they are live or not. You'll see that <laughs> we we work on project as been uh, for. Uh, with, with artists that are not anymore here, obviously. Uh, but um, what is interesting in the museum is really the, this space where that brings value and has a mission. So most of the museum uh, nowadays uh, have really this uh, notion of values and mission that they want to carry it. Uh, and it's, it's always an interesting uh, approach for us to uh, work around those value and mission to provide uh, something a little bit uh, innovative or interactive for, for the museum. Uh, and then finally, the, the last part of uh, those projects is the la uh, it's not the last in the sense that it's not important, but uh, the last, the third leg of it is the inclusivity uh, in a sense that we're trying with those two projects to work with uh, a different approach that will allow some public or uh, uh, are not very well targeted by museum to be more uh, included in the experience of the museum. So of course, uh, one, one of them is uh, uh, visually impaired and blind people. Uh, that has been uh, one of the focus of uh, this uh, research and um, practice. And then, uh, but there's also children, uh, uh, like how to gamify things and so on. And we can, of course, inclusivity larger than that. So I put gender, but as that, in, in our case, uh, the, the key was the visually impaired and the children, where we try to experiment with the museum. Uh, uh, what would be a, a, an approach that allow uh, these publics to be invited and more welcome into a museum to have a, an ex a unique experience that uh, will give them through different sense. Uh, an experience of the, of the museum, uh, of the exhibition of the museum. So next slide, please. So the first uh, project we worked on is with the, the Museum of Art of Macau. 
So this is the, the building of the, the art museum. Uh, and they, they were, this museum has uh, a small collection of uh, art, uh, artifacts, but it's mainly uh, uh, exhibition that are, uh, that are brought from overseas and presented during a couple of months. So the exhibition we work on was a, an exhibition with the British Museum. Uh, next slide, please. So it's been a collaboration uh, among different uh, of our uh, professors and, and students. So the, in this project, it was myself, but also uh, Professor Philippa Morty. Uh, so this exhibition was a three months exhibition run by uh, the British Museum. So everything was coming from London. Uh, and he was presenting uh, drawings uh, from uh, Italian uh, Renaissance artists. So of course it includes the three major ones that everybody knows, so Da Vinci, Raphael, and uh, Michelangelo. Uh, and those uh, drawings, so they, they are usually draft for preparing uh, the masterpiece. So those drawings were never meant to be art pieces exhibit somewhere. But over time, some of them have been uh, kept, uh, and now they are part of uh, this amazing collection from the British Museum that exhibit uh, 52 of those going for, for, from uh, 42 different uh, Italian uh, artists from the Renaissance. Um, and so this exhibition, of course, uh, as you can imagine, when you present uh, drawings, it's only um, a drawing on paper that are displayed on the frame and nobody can touch it. There's usually no colors, uh, and they are usually either preparation for masterpiece or practice from uh, the, 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 the junior artist to learn all the different techniques uh, of the important things uh, at that time for uh, drawing. So like the, the body uh, element, the movement, the, the, uh, all the, the the nature and landscape and so on. Uh, so next uh, slide, please. So the, here I, I, will I will go through a couple of, uh, of those uh, drawings that uh, were presented during this exhibition and then what we, uh, what we did with, uh, with this. Uh, so we tried to investigate a lot of different technology or different techniques to create different experience uh, where uh, our visitor could uh, experiment and more importantly can touch uh, everything. The first one that you see up is the ostrich. Um, and the ostrich, so again, as a drawing, if you imagine uh, any visually impaired people, uh, they won't be able to see much because they, there's no colors. Uh, and if a uh, person is really uh, completely blind, then there's no way of what we created is that we, we use a, an album where we can uh, emphasize in, in 3D uh, the, the, the line, the, 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 the darkness of the, the line of the drawings. And so we end up with uh, this uh, ostrich that uh, coming out basically of this uh, transparent acrylic where people can touch, so feel the outline of it and then touch the the drawing lines on the middle. So we were not necessarily interested to represent uh, physically uh, in 3D the object itself. Otherwise, it would be just uh, purely 3D modeling uh, of a drawing and then 3D printing it or something like that and presenting. We did that for one or two. But, but what we wanted also is to experiment different techniques, uh, different algorithm that allow allow a different experience to the user and see how uh, they react to uh, those, uh, those techniques. So the bottom one also, it's a man from behind uh, with his uh, clothes. Uh, and one also is a similar uh, technique that uh, we use as the ostrich. So next slide. The next slide is, um, I'm not sure if you have it or not, because I cannot see on the screen. Tony. We see it. I hope I'm still on because I, I don't. Uh, 
it seems. Okay. Um, so this one uh, is a portrait of three persons, and you can see how the drawing uh, over time has been damaged and the paper has become yellowish, of course. Uh, so all of these has to be cleaned up, and so we, we had to establish a technical process uh, through uh, computers to clean up all those uh, elements. So we, we end up just with the, the part that I was really uh, what we want to focus on. And then on the right side, you can see the, the engraving uh, that we did for this, is, this one is just out of the, the machine. Uh, the engraving that we did from those uh, uh, from this drawing. Uh, so here, uh, the, the, the experience is not necessarily uh, going to be very interesting uh, to understand the drawing itself because the engraving is really scorching the, the, the really the very uh, thin surface on top of the the material here. Uh, but um, it's an interesting experience to see how. Uh, Especially, we know that uh, visually impaired people deal with their other sense, and so we wanted to understand any chance that they could understand something that, uh, as normal uh, uh, visu uh, visual people, we don't necessarily uh, would uh, detect with our fingers. Uh, so that's uh, that was one of the questions, and the, the answer was we hear that it doesn't bring enough information for them to have an understanding of the drawing. However, it ex experience sensation touching it, not necessarily linked with the drawing, but with the tangible uh, material that they were touching and the variation on the surface uh, that give them some uh, interesting uh, feeling about uh, what they have. Next slide. So this one is a bit uh, similar in the sense that uh, here you can see uh, <clears throat> the, the man uh, and then we what we did is we take the, this uh, drawing, again clean up and keep uh, the, the, the fundamental element of the drawing and then engrave it into an acrylic and then paint it on, uh, on top. So again it's the same, the, the, the sensation is very uh, at top of the surface. It, it just creates an emotion but it doesn't create a meaning. Uh, for the drawing itself, which was, it's not a failure as such for us because it was really experimenting and see what could be the, the, the experience that people can have and whether there would be a, a useful experience to repeat or to, to consider in the future. Next one. So this one uh, is interesting at several levels, but uh, the first thing is those two uh, person are a caricature done by Leonardo da Vinci, and the drawing is really, really, uh, those two drawings, uh, two separate drawings, um, they are very tiny and very small in size. Um, so first we, we, we make them much larger, and then we give, uh, uh, we engrave them, or we, we engrave some part of it, and then light it up to a LED strip at the bottom. So it, it gives some lighting. So obviously here it was less maybe interesting for visually impaired people, uh, like it could be for uh, visual people uh, or for uh, for kids, because you have to experience the the, the light uh, emotion here. Uh, so next one, please. So this one, this is a naked man from uh, behind. That's that's the name of the drawing. Um, a very creative name. And uh, so what we did here, we, we outlined the drawing again, and then we cut it out uh, so people can feel the shape of the, the mane and then the main line of the, of the body. Uh, and then we, we put some uh, uh, paint on the engraving line just to give it a, a visual, an interesting visual uh, aspect of it. And then instead of making one, we actually create a, a series of four of them uh, reverse or left and right uh, and that with, uh, uh, with different uh, golden and black color. The next one, I think I'll have to speed it up a little bit. So this one is, uh, so it, it, uh, we did two of uh, similar like this is where 
uh, we want also to experience a little bit for uh, for children alike. Uh, so it's not necessarily a reserve for for kids, but um, uh, it's to create from a drawing to create a puzzle. And so we, we this one you can see that it, there's not many um, pieces on this puzzle, but when you take it out because there's no colors, uh, this is just the, the, the top of the material that is slightly burned on different level to, to make different level of uh, brown in, in this case of the wood. Uh, so it's actually very difficult to uh, make those puzzles. And so we saw a lot of people uh, taking a lot of time to finish uh, those puzzles. So that was uh, an interesting um, approach for uh, giving a, a simple drawing and experience where we have to pay attention to detail, uh, which we will not necessarily be able to do when we, you have to keep a distance from the original drawing. Um, the next slide. So the, the, this slide, is, it's, uh, this drawing is, is an incredible drawing. Uh, it, it actually was one of the largest ones. It was about 70 cm of, uh, wide. Uh, and uh, the process was quite uh, complex for us to make, it, make out something of it. So we decided to go for a puzzle. So here I quickly show the, the digital work what we have to do. So from a, a very good digital photo of, uh, of the drawing, we clean it up and then we uh, turn it into black and white. We transform the contrast and so on. So a lot of uh, technical uh, model. But then even on the machine side, we actually find out that it was better to do the reverse of what is supposed to do normally on this type of a machine. So we had to cut first and engrave later, which usually it's not the way we do things, uh, but it work out actually better in this case. So here you can see the final result again, not a lot of pieces. Uh, so it's feasible in the time of a visit or in the museum. You cannot have a 1000 piece puzzle uh, uh, in the museum, uh, but we wanted to make sure that uh, it was uh, still feasible, but it, it, it remained quite complex. And again, you have to pay attention to details. Uh, yeah, probably this one, by the nature of the, 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 the drawing itself, was not necessarily uh, focusing on, on kids themselves. Uh, and then the next slide, please. So this slide is, uh, was the entrance of the, the exhibition where we uh, proposed to create three uh, statue uh, bust of uh, the three major artists, so Da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo. So those statues are actually replicate of uh, existing statues, so they've been 3D scanned. And then we, we, we 3D print uh, in pieces those uh, statues because they are uh, 50 cm height, so they are quite actually big, and we don't have 3D printers that big. So we print, we, we take the 3D model, we cut it, and then we print all the pieces, and uh, finally we finish uh, with a, a, a putty system, and then a coating and painting and so on, uh, and varnishing. And it was very interesting to have those statues actually at the beginning because that was the first step into our side of the exhibition, and where we keep inviting people to touch. And that was the, the purpose and a bit the, the trigger where we. Uh, invite people of doing something that is not supposed to do normally in the museum, touch the, the, the art pieces. Uh, and, and, and it was really interesting to see the reaction of people when they start to touch. Not that they are uh, fantastically uh, on, on the material, it's, it's actually plastic that is varnish. Um, but they are uh, being able to touch a piece of art uh, uh, it was a uh, very interesting uh, experience for a lot of people, uh, including kids and uh, visually impaired people uh, as well. So the next few slides are about uh, the process. So I'm going to go very quickly uh, through it so I don't spend more time. So here we take the, the one 3D model. We cut it into different pieces. Next slide. Um, and then here we have the 3D printed pieces. They can be in different colors. It doesn't matter. We assemble them, we glue them, and then we uh, hide the, the cut lines, uh, and then we uh, start to sand, and so on. So next slide. So we sand, then we, we put a, a primer, 
and then uh, spray paint into one color and varnish, and then we have the final result. So that's uh, for this uh, first project. I want to move to the quickly to the second project that we finished uh, last year. So next slide, please. So the second project was with the Macau, uh, the museum of uh, Macau Grand Prix Museum, sorry. Uh, and this uh, museum has been totally renovated in the last uh, three years. Uh, so they destroyed basically the whole building and, and rebuilt it from, from scratch. So they, they recreate all the space, they, make, they put machine to have more experience for people inside and so on. And then they, want, they saw the, our exhibition uh, at the art museum, so they invite us to do uh, also something uh, in the museum. So we start to propose some interactive uh, pieces. Unfortunately, uh, they, they start to be a little bit worried, and then they, they came back and said, oh, we just want a replicate of uh, free cars uh, in 3D printing. So um, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? <coughs> So that was not something that we were very uh, interested in um, because, we, I mean, just replicating something that already existed is not uh, very uh, creative uh, and we wanted to provide uh, more. Unfortunately, times uh, flying, we, we had to uh, come up with uh, something and agree on something. So this is the Grand Prix uh, Museum, part of the Grand Prix Museum. Uh, it is now, uh, and uh, at the end of this corridor, that's where we have our uh, space. So, uh, next slide, please. So, we end up agreeing on replicating three uh, historical cars that they have in the museum one from Michael Schumacher, uh, one uh, from uh, Juan Felix, uh, I think he's a Brazilian driver, if I remember well, uh, and then the last one from the 60s or 50s, sorry, uh, amazing, uh, beautiful car. So what we end up doing is, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so on this slide, what you see is the result, so the exhibition that we set up in the museum. So we, we replicate a car in a one, two, three scale, so they are about a little bit more than one, uh, one meter. Uh, and again, uh, they are 3D model and then cut into piece and 3D printed and then uh, assemble all together and painted and so on. So it's a very long process where we uh, always we try to uh, involve our students to participate. Um, and uh, the final uh, piece is here. Uh, I must highlight that, I mean, although the, the result is there, uh, the problem is that they wanted to use absolutely 3D printing, but there's part of those cars that 3D printing make them very fragile and breakable. So for something that is touch, that's supposed to be tangible uh, and touchable, then that's not good. Uh, so uh, so yeah, there's a there's a few issues here that uh, they are now trying to to solve. Uh, so next slide, please. And I want, I want to finish uh, quickly. So these are photo also from. Uh, <coughs> The, the cars where we went, uh, when we were working on them during our uh, time in the university. Uh, so that's all the, the part of uh, the project. To, to conclude qu quickly on the, this presentation, um, so what, what is interesting really for us here is first the student experience. So we want to involve more and more our students in this kind of experience. So they gain confidence in what they are doing, they learn new process, they try to uh, really be creative on finding solution for uh, whatever we're, they're facing. Uh, we encounter a lot of technical limitations, so that was a problem, especially for the, for the cars, that was one of the main problems we face. Uh, so that's for our side. Well, uh, in more generic terms, the more the, the, the research part of it that we are uh, working on to publish a paper uh, soon, I hope. Uh, uh, we are uh, evaluating all those elements with a visually impaired association in Macau to understand uh, what's working, how it, uh, what it brings to them, uh, and then uh, what could be repeated and what is not useful. Um, well, yeah, we encounter a problem of the creativity control, so with the cars where 
we were not basically able to do what we wanted to do and to be more creative. Uh, and what's going to be the next few, the next step for this kind of project for us is most probably uh, running into a more virtual environment as well. Uh, so you can see the museum here, they come back to us and start to talk about this. This is definitely linked with the, uh, the pandemic situation that we are living Excuse in. Excuse me, Gerald. Just for reference in Macau, Sorry, can you, can you conclude because, Gerald. We started at the very it, beginning, uh, yeah. end of January uh, uh, 2020. Yeah. And we are still uh, locked in Macau. Uh, so this is something that we are uh, very much uh, concerned here. And the virtual environment is an element where we are uh, really working on uh, to provide uh, experience uh, for museum in a, in a different context. So yeah, I think I will hand it up here and give you back the microphone. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, thank you, Gerard. This was a talk about all the process. It was important for the Artec to have you here to discuss a little bit of it. Uh, it was a little bit uh, by side of our main team, but it was important to know what you are doing. I have to say some words about all this session. In fact, you are beyond our schedule, which means that uh, we don't have time for uh, uh, questions. Instead, if you really want to make one or two, but uh, what I would like to thank it is uh, your breathing condition for us and all the time that we had with this uh, process of the, the power of the sound and the waves that we keep thinking. It was very inspiring. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Uh, I have some questions, but uh, then we have time to discuss that. Lúcia, como sempre, muito provocadora. Lúcia, as, al as always, very provocative. You brought us um, a conclusion about the relationship between AI and the possibilities that, opened, that are open to artists, giving the tonics to these relations that we have with this construction of the modernism and postmodernism and how that affects us. Thank you so very much for this thought that you left us for us to reflect on. Miriam absolutely giving all the relationship with images and about the society and the impact that images have on it. Images that produce images and get to images, and it's a theme that is very present in this debate about the future and the relationship with the works. And Gerald, thank It's a pity we not go to Macau to see all that and touch all that things, but in fact, is the way it is. I'm sorry, I have to close. Sorry, I will have to close the session because we are really behind schedule and we have to go to the lab to make tests because of trips that we have scheduled for today. Thank you for being here today and thank you so very much to all of you. Thank you. Bye bye.